Hello there, ACCA MA students. My name is Steve Willis. Let me help you pass your exam. This video is for anyone who is getting ready to sit the ACCA MA exam. Well, the syllabus is very broad and I'm sure you are fatigued from studying from the many hundreds of pages in your textbook. Maybe you're confused by some of the questions that you've been practicing. Well, let me show you some templates or pro formas or visual systems that will help you pass your exam. I've summarized the templates that I'm going to show you on this document here. You can download this at the link on the screen and it's also in the description of the video. So just scroll down, click on that, you can download it. Now let's look at some exam questions. Let's just jump right in. So imagine you're at your exam center. You're taking the exam. You press the next button and this question emerges on your screen and we see immediately we see some graphs. Well, if you see graphs, you need to come back, okay, to this template right here, okay? It's an easy concept, cost behavior, but a lot of people have trouble with, the, with these graphing questions. So I want you to remember, you need to look here, okay? A variable cost will always start where the vertical and the horizontal axis meet. A fixed cost has to be starting here, and a semi-variable cost will also be starting somewhere up the horizontal, because that would be a fixed cost. Now, if we're talking about units, remember that the fixed cost per unit will always decrease as activity levels increase. That's the idea of economy of scale, spreading the fixed costs over more units. That's why companies like Ikea that produce millions of pieces of furniture per year, that's why they can sell them at such low costs. Variable cost per unit, okay? If one chair costs $10, $10 per unit. Two chairs would be 20. That's still a variable cost of 10 per unit. Okay, so you got to know these graphs. Let's jump back at this question now. So what I want you to do first, you always read this requirement and you have to identify what type of cost are we talking about. The graph depicts the total cost of raw materials, not the unit cost, total cost, okay? So we are working off of these, okay? Not this one, this is total, that's the unit level cost below, those are the total costs above. Now, let's read the little story. Up to a given activity level in each period, the purchase price of a unit of raw material is constant. After that point, a lower per unit applies, price per unit applies to the units purchased and retrospectively. Pause the video, try this on your own, see if you can get it. All right, raw materials, you need to know are variable. So the graph has to start from here. Guys, that one is semi-variable. So this one comes out. Okay. Now, I'm eliminating. That's a great way to do these questions. You, you, you eliminate and you find the best answer. You never look for the perfect answer. Okay, just eliminate and find the best. Now, look at all of these. All of these graphs show a drop, but check this out. That one's not pointing where it should. If it were variable, that's pointing over here. So graph A is depicting a cost that is transformed into a semi-variable cost at some point. That's out. Now, look at this. This one points at the right place. So it's either C or D. C depicts the discount only applying to the units above some activity level. D depicts the 
retrospective discount applied to all the units. So the answer, everybody, is D. Friends, let's look at another question here. And you always read this requirement first. And we see what would be the effects on the economic order quantity and the total annual holding cost of a decrease in the cost of ordering a batch of raw materials. EOQ. Well, you need to know the formula. You can find it in the formula page, but you can also just memorize it. Right? What's the favorite food of Brits, British people? Well, British people, if you've ever been there, they love fish and chips, which you just remember. Two pieces of cod over CH, right? Two times the cost of placing an order times annual demand over the annual holding cost and the square root of that figure. So you know that formula, I'm sure. But look at this. This These answers are logical rather than numerical. So, hmm, are we going to just do a brute force test? No, let me show you a nice system for answering a logical question on EOQ. Okay. Well, you need to remember that EOQ, we're looking at two components of the annual inventory cost, and that would be the annual holding cost. And that one moves in positive correlation with activity. Just think about this. If the delivery truck brings larger and larger deliveries, we need a bigger and bigger storage room. So we're going to pay more and more rent the bigger the delivery is. Now, the annual ordering cost, that's the one that has negative correlation with activity. Think about this. Imagine if we order everything we need for one year in advance. Well, that would just be one delivery truck and one purchase order, right? So I can conceptualize that on the fly if I need to. One of them is positive, one of them is negative, and you need to remember then that the economic order quantity is the intersection of these two figures, right? It's when the annual ordering cost is equal to the annual holding cost because that will give us the lowest total cost of inventory. And if you don't believe me, go back into your textbooks. All the textbooks have nice visual descriptions of this. Now, we know that that's EOQ that's the both the annual holding cost and the ordering cost. Let's go back and do that question. So I get a question like this. Watch this. I just can draw this quickly. Scratch paper. One of them goes up. That's the annual holding cost. One of them goes. It's really a curve, right? We know it's really a curve. But just to be quick, just to Use, use a template, just draw it like that, okay? EOQ is there, annual holding cost is there. Let's not forget the annual ordering cost there, guys. Now, what happens? What would be the effect on the EOQ if the ordering cost decreases? So all you have to do is redraw this line lower. Look at that. Look at what's gonna happen. Now we have a new EOQ, we have a new holding cost. Both of them come down. Isn't that cool? So the answer then lower, lower, D. Guys, let me show you what it looks like if the question talks about a change in holding cost instead of ordering cost. Imagine it was an increase in the annual holding cost. Then it will still start, the holding cost will still start at 0.0. .0. And then you just draw it with a greater slope. That would be an increase. Now, look at this. You just redraw those lines. And we see that the, and the, the economic order quantity would decrease. And both costs would then increase. There you go. EOQ, friends. Next topic, overheads. You need to be ready to deal with overheads. Make sure you give this chapter... A lot of love. There are many questions on overheads in the databases. 
for your exams. Now, no matter how complicated they want to make a question about overheads, it's only one of three things, really, if we boil it down. The first type of question they ask you is allocation. Look at this. There's no prefix, allocation. We're allocating overheads to departments. That's the easiest one. Now, imagine we have a bill for rent. How do we allocate the rent to the production department, to the packaging department, to the canteen, to the service department? Well, maybe on the square meters that each department uses would be a way to assign overheads to the cost centers. How about our HR costs? Well, maybe we could allocate the HR costs on the number of employees. Okay, that's the easy one. Then we get anything with the word re, reallocate, reapportion. Guys, that's the story of moving the service departments to the production departments, right? Because now we're trying to show the overhead cost per unit. So we need to allocate then we reallocate, and then we absorb like a sponge. That's the cost units absorbing, sucking up the overheads. Well, before we get there, let's do the reallocate bit. And let's have a look at a question. Okay, guys, you press next on your computer-based exam. And this question pops up. What do you read first? You always read this first. I see reapportionment. I see the word re, or I see the prefix re. What is the total overhead for production cost center P? Guys, this is a standard type of question. And what do we need to do? Read the story if you'd like, try it on your own, pause it, and we can work together. Okay, guys, we have production cost centers, P and Q, and service cost centers, X and Y. So we've got these guys and these guys. Now, the whole point of this exercise is to show the service department costs in the production department costs so we can then absorb those costs into the cost units. And we see that they only want us to deal with P. So the way I set this up, I need three columns. I need a column P, I need a column X, I need a column Y. Now, before I get started, I have a look at the answers, and the answers are all pretty rounded off to the thousand, and all of those numbers are pretty far apart. So I'm going to work in thousands and save a lot of time. Okay? So we've got 95 for P, 46 for X, 30 for Y. Let's look over here. We need to get rid of Y, right? So 10% of Y, let's get rid of the 30 here. So Y will be gone. 10% there. And 60% to Q. Well, we don't care about Q in a multiple choice question. We only care about the answer. And then we care about the 30%. Okay, so that would be nine. Y is done. Now let's add up X and we get a 49. Let's clear out X. What percentage goes over to P? Well, 50%, right? So it's one half of 49. Twenty-four point five. So look at this. We could guess now it has to be one of the two that has this, the 0 0.5 in thousands there. And look at that, we can do some mental math and we can see that it's just D, guys. I don't re even really need a calculator for that. Okay, that comes to five, eight, 
12. There it is. 128.5 is the answer. Friends, next topic. Marginal and absorption costing profit reconciliation. This is a, a pretty tricky topic to comprehend. A lot of people on my courses start getting a little stuck on this topic, so if you are fuzzy about this one, it is completely normal. Now, even if you are a little bit fuzzy about this topic, you can still answer the questions. If you'd like more background information on this, check out another video that I have. The link is below. But let's just jump in and solve this question together. I see in, I, I always read this first, the requirement. What would the profit be for the next period using marginal costing? Friends, when I see profit and marginal costing, right, in the same requirement there, there's only one template that I need. And let me show you how that works. Okay, we'll do it right here. It works in alphabetical order. So we have inventory and we have profit. So I stands for inventory. P stands for profit. Guys, can you remember that? Yes, you can. Now, we have two types of inventory. We have closing and opening. We have two types of profit. We've got the AC profit, we've got the marginal costing, absorption costing, marginal costing. Whole thing alphabetical. IP, closing, opening, AC, MC. Now, sometimes they don't give you closing, opening, but they might give you just indication of production and sales. If they give us production and sales instead of inventory, closing, opening, it works the same way. Now, the whole thing we're the whole point of this, if the opening inventory is lower than the closing, then the MC will be lower than the AC profit, okay? And vice versa. Now, if that is a little fuzzy, go read about that in your textbook, okay? Watch my other video, but let me show you how to do the question here. So, we are looking for marginal costing. Let's identify what we're looking for. We're, we're looking for this one, MC. Now let's just plug in the numbers. It's a template. They give me production of 14,000. We can do this in thousands. Look, all of the answers are rounded, 14. Sales are 12, okay? They give me absorption costing profit of 36. So if you remember this template, now we just draw the sign, okay, like that. If production is greater than sales, we produce more than we sell, closing inventory will be greater than opening inventory, and I'm looking for marginal costing. It has to be lower. So check this out. I just crossed these two out. Now it's a 50-50 bet, flip a coin. Okay, That's the first part of this template. The second part of this template is this. The change in inventory multiplied by the overhead absorption rate per unit, not per hour, is equal to the change in profit. Guys, if you remember this template, you can do any of these questions. No matter how difficult it is, the answer always lay in the template. So, change in inventory, guys, is two. The overhead absorption rate, guys, that's spreading the budgeted fixed costs over the budgeted units, right? So that's gonna be the budgeted production costs over the budgeted activity in units. Can we find that info? Sure we can. Do we have some fixed costs right here? We don't want the selling expenses, right? Those are non-production. Those go below gross profit. We don't include those in inventory valuation, just fixed overheads, right? So, and we see our budgeted, our normal activity is 14. So that's going to be 63 over 14. 
So that comes to nine. Change in profit will be nine, and it will be nine lower. So that would be a 27. Is that answer there? Yes, it is. Answer, friends, is B. Okay. There you go. Very useful, helpful template to get you out of trouble on your MA exam. And that template is right here, by the way. Here is that template right on your screen. We've also done EOQ already. All right, let's move on, friends. Guys, next topic, over, under, absorption. Be ready for this. Don't go into your MA exam unless you can do a question like this. You press next, a question similar to this will pop up. You read this part first, and I see over, under, absorption, okay? I have a quick look up here. I see an overhead absorption rate, some budgeted hours. I know what to do. Let me share with you the template to solve any over under absorption question. Again, it works in alphabetical order. You need to remember these letters. O H A. That stands for overheads absorbed. O H I overheads incurred, the difference between those two figures will be the under or the over absorption. Okay. Now, alphabetical order, OHA, OHI, under, over absorption. Overheads absorbed, that is the product of two figures. You've got it, you got to find, right? The first one would be some actual activity level. So overheads are hitting our P&L either on the, on, the, on the units or on the consumption of the hours. So we got to find the actual hours. In this case, it's hours. I jumped ahead a little bit. Multiply by the overhead absorption rate. And that would be your OHA. OHI, that's the actual overhead. The PL has been absorbing overheads based on this overhead rate and based on this, this driver. And then at the end of the period, we open our letters, right? Because this is the olden days and we, we get our invoices out and we see, oh, we actually spent this much. And the difference then is under or over absorption. Negative will be under, positive will be over. So let's just plug in the figures. Actual activity. Well, a company uses an overhead absorption rate of 350 per hour. Right there, let's plug that right in. Black will work better. based on 32,000 budgeted hours. That's for the overhead absorption rate. During the same period, the actual overhead expenditure was 108.875. And we had 30,000 hours. Okay. So 30,000 times 350, well, that's gonna be 105,000. So right away, it's under absorption. And right away, I see that it's answer A, isn't it? Because look at this, it's not a round number. It's gonna have 875 there. So it's under absorbed by 3875, okay? Under absorption, negative. Our P&L didn't suck up enough cost. We need to add more cost. That's a bad thing, okay? Over absorption would be when our P&L absorbed too much. We took in too much cost into the P&L, so we got to get rid of some. Now, here's a bonus question for you. You ready for a bonus question, guys? What were the budgeted overheads? Could we figure that out? Yes, we can. Another template that you need, overhead absorption rate, right? Over had absorption rate. That's always the budgeted costs over some budgeted 
activity level. In this case, machine hours. Okay, so we know the overhead absorption rate, 3.5. We know budgeted hours of 32. That's right, 32. Guys, could we solve for x? Sure we could. 32 times 3.5 equals 112. Okay, that's a little bonus question for you. I hope you are finding this video useful. I've taken you through now many of the templates on this page. I'd like to come over here to the right side and we're going to end talking about process costing. Many people consider this one of the most difficult parts of MA, and it's a big chapter in your book again, and there are different process costing situations that you can be uh, tested on. So first thing you need to know, there are three things you are responsible. It all boils down to three approaches. First approach is when they ask you to determine if there is an abnormal gain or loss, and then the value of the abnormal gain, abnormal loss, and the good output. Okay, That's a two-step approach. You get the expected cost per unit. And then you plug those figures into your process account. I'll give you a video on this one next time. I want to move to the difficult part right here, process costing two. Now they're going to ask you about value of output and the keyword WIP, work in progress, aka WIP. Let me show you how to do this type of question. You press next. This beast of a question shows up on your computer screen. What do you do first? You always read this first. What was the value of the units transferred into finished goods? Hmm, I'm curious. What am I going to do? Well, I need a little bit more information to understand which template to deploy. So I read. A company operates a process costing system and it had work in progress at the beginning of the month of 300 units. Guys, that's a trigger. So I know that, that I need a four-step approach to solving this question. Guys, this is a difficult one. If I were you, I would flag it and press next and go get easier marks. Go do easier things and then come back to this one. I would hate for you to spend, to go over your time limit trying to solve this, missing out on two or three easier questions that might just be a couple of clicks away. But let's do it together. Okay. I also see another keyword jumping out at me. FIFO method. So let me show you how to do this FIFO method. First thing. Okay is the physical flow. That is step one, guys, physical flow. Stay it, say it at home. We can't do any cost allocation until we reconcile the units. And I always do this one way. I have some opening work in progress, opening whip, plus some units that I add in or units that I start that's the input. That's going to be equal to the output, which is the units completed plus the closing whip, right? So one side equals the other side. And we just plug in the physical units to get balancing figures. What do we see? Well, pause this. If you'd like to try this on your own, please pause it. See if you can do it and then roll the video when you're ready to keep rocking. Well, we see opening whip, 3,000. 300, excuse me, not 3,000. We see 
the units added is unknown. But they tell us 2,000 units were completed. So that's what I'm looking for, guys. I'm looking for the output side. And what they often do, maybe they give you this, okay? And then you would add those up and you can arrive at either figure. You could, you could do an algebraic dance to get anywhere you need to. Okay, we didn't know that, but we didn't need it because we're looking for this. Now, they didn't mention anything about closing work in progress. If they don't mention it, it does not exist. And there should be another zero there, right? Okay, so we're doing first in, first out. So imagine we're making electric scooters. We ended the month, we, we, we started our period with 300 incomplete scooters. So we finish up the incomplete units before we start making new ones. Okay, so units completed is composed. Of the opening whip 300 plus balancing figure which would be the, the ones started and finished which would be 1700 guys step one physical flow reconcile the physical units now step two we have to deal with the incomplete units and we do that Okay, with a mechanism called equivalent units. Imagine my wife and I are taking my two kids, little kids, and their two friends on a picnic. How much food should I bring? Well, I'm not going to bring food for six adults because the kids don't eat that much. Well, I'm going to bring food for one adult, food for an an another adult, and maybe food for one adult would feed two kids. So I will bring food for four people because those children are equivalent units, aren't they? Okay, That's the idea of equivalent units, dealing with partially completed production. And the output from the previous step becomes the input. So we would need three things here. And it's always the same when we're doing FIFO. Okay, so we have opening whip, SF started finished, closing whip. Okay? And we start with the physical units. 300, 1700, zero. And then we need a percentage completed in this period. Well, the started and finished, they were nothing at the beginning and they were completed at the end. So it's always 100%. Now, they said that the opening whip was partially complete, 60% complete. So to turn something that's 60% complete I'll just multiply by 1 minus 0 0.6. That's a 40%, isn't it? So we've got a 120 here, 1,700 here, 0 there. So, friends, my equivalent units is 1, 8, 2, 0. Guys, step 1, physical flow. Step 2, equivalent units. Step three, cost per equivalent unit. And they were very nice. They just gave us that as a $10. Look at this. The cost per equivalent unit was $10. Right here, cost per equivalent unit, $10. I can give you a bonus question here. What were the, what were the process costs for the month? Well. Could we work backwards? Sure we could. $10 per equivalent unit, 1,820 equivalent units. So the cost would be an X, right? That would be uh, 18,200. But they didn't ask for that. Guys, first step, physical flow. Second step, equivalent units. Third step, cost per equivalent units, unit. Fourth step, 
the answer will lay in the fourth step value of output okay and we have three things here we have the opening whip which is part of the units completed right the opening whip and the started and finish now we work with the equivalent units cost per equivalent unit not cost per physical unit so we had 120 of these 1700 of these times 10 times 10 that is 120 that is 17,000 now guys when we're doing FIFO first in first out got to think about this well these incompleted scooters that we started working on they came into the accounting period partially completed already valued at 1710 1710 okay that all goes in here right because we finish up the incomplete ones before we start working on new ones when you go back and you do this under weighted average then you spread them evenly imagine it's an oil refinery so we're spreading the opening whip between units completed and the closing whip but I digress okay so we have to consider that costs brought forward and we said that was 1710 so we add those figures up zero one nine nineteen nine one zero is that answer in the list yes it is answer is a guys i hope you found this video useful if you did please throw down a like tell your friends now if you have any more questions please put them in the comments section and I will do my best in a timely manner to help you through any further questions. Guys, Steve signing out for now. Good luck on your MA exam.